For those of you who joined us, this is going to be a very different online event than what you're probably accustomed to. I am not going to sit here and talk to you for an hour, and you just have to listen while you read your email and surf the internet and do other things. And so realistically, the ABCs of CMMC is a conversation that was set up for those of you who have done events with Class LLC before, you should be accustomed to our format where we're really facilitating an opportunity for people to come together and have a discussion. To support that discussion, my goal today is to highlight some basic ideas and basic fundamentals of the Cyber Maturity Model Certification. Based on that highlighting, then we can go into a discussion. If people are willing, I'd love to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself, highlight a concern that you have and share some perspective that you have. One of the benefits that we have with CMMC is the confusion that exists because of the CMMC advisory board. When this was established as a program and as a requirement from the United States Department of Defense to improve security measures for the defense industrial base, the Cyber Maturity Model Certification Advisory Board was established to make sure that everybody understood what to do, how to do it, what were their criteria. In addition to that, there was a framework that was established that had a collection of domains that governed the security practices and controls that need to be in place to protect controlled unclassified information for the Department of Defense. Now, what has happened since that idea was originally implemented is that there have been a lot of changes, there has been a lot of confusion, there's been a lot of uncertainty, there have been a lot of declarations that were made that were then retracted. And so my objective today is not to answer all of the questions about how the program should work, Instead, the objective today is to facilitate a discussion and get everybody thinking about what are the things that my organization needs to do to be prepared for success once all of these other people who have come up with all of these ideas basically get their act together, have good guidance, and then tell us how to move forward. Given my experience with the Federal Information Security Management Act when that was passed in 2002 and FedRAMP, which is the federal risk assessment and management program for cloud service providers, we know that CMMC is coming and we know that it's going to be a nightmare for organizations who have not prepared in advance. And so when we talk about an imperative in the outline and we talk about an imperative when we describe why did you come to this meeting and why do you want to be part of the conversation, ultimately the imperative, if I put it up in lights and it was one slide with a flashing word, is that you want to prepare as much as possible in advance so that your organization has the least amount of effort to align all of your practices, all of your policies, and all of your controls with the requirements that are going to allow you to continue to do business. Now, in the real world, because the Department of Defense is so stringent, and because DFARS has defined specific clauses that outline the requirements of contractors, and there's all kinds of guidance that talks about and defines what is controlled unclassified identification, what are the handling procedures, what do you need to consider, what needs to be in place. Once the requirements are formalized and implemented, and they are practices that are an obligation, not an idea, there's going to be very little time for organizations to then try to get their act together and request some kind of leeway or some kind of consideration for them to get everything in place so that they can keep doing business. You know, if you go back to my time in the Army, it is what it is. You know, they, t they give you an order, they expect you to follow it. If you're not following the order, if we're doing common task training, they used to say you are either a go or a no-go at this station. If you're a go, you can continue on. If you're a no-go, you have to go to the back of the line and try again. It is very wise to expect in advance. This is the approach that the Department of Defense is going to use once CMMC is formalized, once they have all the certified third-party assessment organizations, and once they start enforcing the requirements. Historically, if you go back and look at how did all of this come about, once upon a time, there was this thing called DFARS, which was the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement. The objective of DFARS was to define for everybody involved in the defense industrial base as part of the DOD supply chain, 
What are my roles? What are my responsibilities? What are my requirements? What is everything that I need to be able to do and everything that I must do to satisfy whatever obligation exists for me to do business with the Department of Defense? Now, historically, a lot of the requirements were self-certification. You know, I would self-certify that I've done security. I would self-certify that I've um, delivered whatever had to be delivered. And over time, we have discovered that self-certification does not guarantee results, and it does not guarantee that people have satisfied the requirements. And so smart people came along and said, you know what, for FISMA and for FedRAMP, where self-certification is not an option, and you have a third-party certification where an independent third-party assessment organization is going to come in, evaluate, assess, and certify that the organization is meeting its obligation. Because this works for the civilian federal agencies, it is likely going to work to improve the security of the defense industrial base that is supporting the Department of Defense and all of the military agencies. As we drive towards that goal and achieving that outcome, what companies have to continue to realize is that we're not doing this just to do it. Why we're really doing this is to save the lives of the war fighters who are on the battlefield, serving the missions and the objectives and the initiatives of whatever the military is doing as directed by the commander in chief and the Department of Defense. And so if we're doing a peacekeeping mission, we want to make sure that the information systems, the weapon systems, and all of the components are resistant to cyber attack as well as physical attack, and that our enemies are not using our information against us. If it's a wartime mission, that same concept is going to apply. If it is emergency services, because there's been a natural disaster. At the end of the day, whether it's um, peacekeeping, whether it's military oriented, or whether it is just helping the community, the goal and the objective of DFARS, especially when you look at clause 252.204-7012, is to make sure that every component or every activity related to network penetrations and network defenses and cybersecurity is in place and is appropriate to satisfy the protection requirements that have been identified. And so with that story that leads us into the conversation, for the sake of argument, I'm going to highlight some specific objectives. From those specific objectives, we can kind of we can then transition into the discussion component of the meeting. If you're just late and you're wondering what in the world is going on, this is not a presentation where I'm just going to read a bunch of slides to you. Everybody can read the slides themselves. The objective really is for us to have a conversation. We happen to be doing it online. The result of the conversation, hopefully, is that everybody leaves with a little more knowledge. They know the resources that they need to look at. They know what they need to do to be successful. Success in our context means that I'm a civilian organization that provides services to the Department of Defense, and I want to keep providing those services because I have met all of the requirements. And so from the beginning, the DOD has decided to propose an amendment to the Defense Federal Acquisition, to the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement. That is a mouthful, that is why they call it DFARS. The objective is similar to what you had in FISMA or what you had with FISMA in 2002, where the Federal Information Security Management Act as part of the E-Government Act standardized security practices across all of the civilian federal organizations within the United States. And so now we have 18 years of history with a program that standardizes security across the entire federal government. And we are leveraging a same approach with the updates to DFARS to ensure that we have a standard approach for security for everybody who is a DOD contractor or is providing services, tools, technology, or resources to the defense industrial base. The updated version of DFARS applies to a standard methodology for, for assessing DOD contractor compliance with all of the security requirements that are in NIST Special Publication 800-171. For those of you who have not worked with NIST, Special Publication 800-171 is a control catalog that focuses on protecting controlled unclassified information and non-federal information systems and organizations. It is a subset of the controls that are in NIST Special Publication 800-53. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
in this special publication 800-53, which is what all of the federal agencies were using to protect all of the government IT systems. And so when you look at NIST 800-171, you still have the same control families. You have a control family for access control, for identity and access management, for auditing, for network communications, for system and information integrity. There is a collection of control families that are described in the catalog. And in the NIST 800-171, you have a set of controls that are for non-governmental systems. If we were only if we were applying the same controls to everything, then we could have continued to use NIST 800-53. But the focus on non-governmental systems is how you end up with a defined catalog in the special publication 800-171 that supports non-federal agencies and continues to be reasonable and appropriate. Realistically, if your organization is a civilian organization whether you're doing business with the federal government or you're doing business with the Department of Defense, if you build your security program and your risk management framework and your compliance framework and all of your enterprise controls based on NIST 800-171, you have a very good foundation for resilience, for continuity, for security, for privacy, for the integrity of the information that you have and the availability of your systems because NIST 800-171 covers a broad scope of concerns that are going to influence the security practices within your organization. Now, where the DOD is concerned, and you apply this to DFARS, the DOD standard methodology is meant to validate that contractors implement their security requirements consistently and appropriately exactly as NIST 800-171 was written. If we apply this to our conversation about the ABCs of CMMC, one of the requirements that you will recognize in the documentation is that if you did not document and implement your controls exactly how NIST 800-171 prescribes, then you are a no-go at this station and you have not satisfied the requirement for whatever control is in question. The controls that are in question vary based on the level of maturity that is required. So within the CMMC, they have five levels, where level one is a starting point. And as you progressively increase from level one to level two to level three to level four to level five, you're gradually adding additional controls. And at the same time, you're gradually adding additional practices so that the implementation of your controls and the practices for the management and the execution of those controls gradually increase over time. And so the more mature you are, the better you're going to be able to protect controlled unclassified information. The requirements for protecting controlled unclassified information are going to be associated with the type of information that you have. Realistically, controlled unclassified information can be any type of data that your organization has about the Department of Defense. Now, one thing that the DOD came out with in March 6th of 2020 is DOD Instruction 5200.48. That is the information and the instructions for defining controlled unclassified information and all of the requirements. And so in DOD Instruction 5200.48, they talk about gen general issuance information, they talk about responsibilities, they talk about different roles that are involved they talk about programmatics. How do you disseminate, decontrol, and destruct controlled unclassified information? The entire management lifecycle of controlled unclassified information so that you understand what you're dealing with and what's in scope of the cyber maturity model certification is in that DOD instruction. And then all of the information that's provided by the CMMC advisory board on their website or from acq.od.mil is going to be the implementation and the management of all of your controls. Now, for those of you who have sent me messages, because this is a discussion, not a webinar, that reminded me that, hey, your slides aren't moving. I only have one slide. So I once did a keynote presentation and talked for 90 minutes with one slide. If we can do that for a keynote, we can do that for this because I'm providing all of the background information that is gonna help everybody ask good questions consider what they need to do and understand how everything is going. Now, as a follow-up, for those of you who have joined us and are interested and want to learn more, we'll provide follow-up 
we will provide follow-up information. You know, we've done presentations recently with the legal profession and with other industries where we're really just having a conversation. As a result of the conversation, the really good questions that people ask, we'll put them on paper, we'll document the answers and then distribute that to the group. That is one of the reasons that we ask people to register so we can make sure that we share all of the good findings with everybody in the crowd. Now with that said, again, as a point of interest, DOD instruction 5200.48 is gonna be your official definition of controlled unclassified information, how it should be used, what the responsibilities are, and what your expectations are. The cyber maturity model, the cyber maturity model certification with all of the levels are going to describe the obligation that your organization has when it's storing, processing, or transmitting controlled unclassified information. Now, one question that always comes up in conversations, how do I know what level I need to be in the CMMC model? The best answer is gonna come from your DOD partner because they are gonna have specific obligations and requirements for their organization and they are going to translate those requirements into your statement of work and into your official documentation for the relationship that you have with them. And so once those requirements are defined for your DOD partner, your DOD partner is going to push those requirements down to every contractor and every subcontractor who is providing services and support to the organization. And so again, when you kind of go back to DFARS and you look at the specific clauses, in addition to defining a standard methodology for the implementation of the security controls, there is also going to be a requirement to document and review your security plans and provide some level of attestation that everything is in process, that it is working effectively. And the DOD has adopted the NIST idea of continuous monitoring. So this is not something where I'm going to check a lot of boxes. I say that all the boxes are checked and they're gonna leave me alone. What you're building with CMMC is going to be a digital transformation or an organizational transformation that incorporates all of the security practices, all of the security controls, all of the security policies that are relevant to your organization that are documented in NIST 800-171 that are going to influence the way that you do business, especially related to the way that your business supports the Department of Defense. Now, the criticality of data is going to influence your CMMC level. Level one, however, is going to have a, a, around 100 controls. You know, NIST keeps updating the revision of the 800-171, and every time NIST updates a revision, they're either adding controls or, consoli or consolidating controls within a control family. And so as part of your ongoing maintenance of your security program, it's going to be important that your organization downloads a copy of NIST 800-171, looks at the controls, understands the controls, monitors the changes, monitors the updates to revisions, looks at the request for information when NIST does a public request for comments about their security standards. All of that is going to be part of the program so that you remain aware and informed of what you're going to encounter and the steps that you need to take. Similarly, a lot of your NIST controls require a review at least annually whenever a significant change occurs or when a compromise happens related to security controls that you have in place. And so the idea that I'm just going to put things in place, check a bunch of boxes, put it in the closet and forget about it is not really an idea that is going to be satisfactory. This is extremely important when you're dealing with the Department of Defense and to an extent it is going to trickle down to some of the federal agencies. And so the um, STARS-3 contract that comes from the GSA is a contract vehicle that influences a lot of projects and activities that happen with the civilian government. We have already seen in 2020, the STARS-3 contract makes references to CMMC or makes references to NIST 800-171. With both civilian contracts and with DOD contracts, even if you think you have a five-year contract, what you really have is a base year plus option years that the federal government or that the Department of Defense can choose not to exercise future option years if you fail to maintain the requirements that are in DFARS for the DOD 
or if you fail to maintain the requirements that are in the federal acquisition regulation for civilian organizations. And so again, as an imperative, it is critically important that organizations understand how do I put the controls in place? How do I maintain the controls? How do I update the controls? And how do I maintain an understanding of the effectiveness of the controls while they're in place, which is an expression of continuous monitoring that the civilian government has been doing for years as part of FISMA. It is also continuous monitoring is something that shows up in FedRAMP, which has been used for cloud service providers for years. Now for very critical systems, this is going to be things that are at CMMC level four or CMMC level five. The DOD may request an on-site validation or demonstration of the effectiveness of your controls so that they have a high level of confidence that you have actually implemented things the way that you said you implemented them. For level one, for level two, for level three, those levels of CMMC are often going to allow you to use a third party, a certified third party assessment organization, also known as C3PAO. That organization is going to be able to come in, do an assessment, and the result is similar to something like a SOC 2 Type 2 or ISO 27000 certification, where they've looked at all the controls, they have used the controls as a guide to evaluate are they effective? Are they in place? Are they satisfying the requirements? And then you will get your magical certificate of awesomeness once the certification has been complete. But because of that continuous monitoring component, you should expect that you're gonna to have to do periodic reviews so that you can maintain your certification. Your certification is not going to last indefinitely, just like your authorization to operate in FISMA is not something that lasts indefinitely without a subsequent review. And just like your FedRAMP certification for your cloud service providers is not something that lasts indefinitely without a subsequent review. Now, whether the assessment is conducted by a contractor for level one, two, three, or whether the assessment is conducted by the Department of Defense for CMMC level four or level five, the same scoring methodology is going to be used. The CMMC documentation talks about the scoring methodology, but if you want to prepare in advance, NIST 800-171A is the guide that you use to audit and evaluate the effectiveness of all of the controls that you put in place. And so say your organization decides, I want to be proactive. The CMMC advisory board doesn't have their stuff together, but I know for a fact that we're going to do business with the Department of Defense. I know for a fact that we don't have any semblance of a security program that aligns to NIST 800-171, so we can proactively look at the control catalog, start implementing controls, and then do a self-evaluation of the effectiveness of the controls by using 800-171A. The benefit of NIST is that NIST 800-171, NIST 800-171A, and all of the supplemental guidance that talks about improving the effectiveness of specific controls and specific families are all free documents. And so these documents are going to be listed in the Computer Security Resource Center at NIST. And so if you go to csrc.nist.gov and then you click on special publications, it is very easy to download and review the current revision of 800-171 and 800-171A. In practice, these documents are going to work together to tell you what to do and then how to evaluate how well have I, have I done it. It's the CMMC documentation that is going to tell you which controls are required for which level. And so 100% of the controls are going to be required at CMMC level 5. A subset of the controls are going to be required for CMMC level 1. And then you have additional controls that are added as you go from level 1 to level two, to level three, to level four, to level five. Again, as I said earlier in the conversation, at the very beginning, my first set of controls to achieve the requirements for CMMC level one is going to be about 100 controls across multiple control families that are documented in the NIST 800-171 control catalog. Most organizations do not have a piggy bank full of security control money where they can just go to the bank, break it open with a hammer, and then I magically have implemented 100 controls. 
And so the idea that I want to proactively start building my program is going to be very valuable for a lot of organizations because you can get started with your policies right now. You can get started with your procedures right now. You can get started with documenting the technical controls that you have in place right now. And because of the delays from the CMMCAB and because of the delays that were introduced as a result of COVID-19, you actually have a little more time to get everything in place, to get it ready and to get it prepared for the assessment. That time is going to be imperative, but it's not something that you wanna waste. You know, as a company, Class LLC has worked with municipalities, small businesses, large organizations, and before Class LLC, I worked at the Centers for Disease Control and implemented similar variations of this program for FISMA and for FedRAMP. And in every case, it takes at least six to nine months just to get the foundation of the program in place. If you don't have an existing governance framework within your organization, it is going to take a meaningful amount of time to get all of the business leaders, the executives, the non-technical business counterparts within the organization to understand, approve, and adopt the policy and procedure for every control family that's in the NIST 800-171. And so the answer to the question, what are we doing for encryption? What type of encryption are we going to use? Is it going to be FIPS 140-2? Is it going to be FIPS 140-3? What level of encryption are we going to require? How are we going to implement it? How are we going to manage the keys? Are we going to use key escrow? The answer to all those questions influences the technical implementation of your controls, but it's also a policy and governance conversation that has to take place. It has to be endorsed. It has to be approved by the organization. And I'm only talking about encryption. Then you start getting into identity and access management. Are we doing multi-factor authentication? How are we doing configuration management? How are we ensuring that all of our requirements are now pushed on to the third parties and subcontractors that we use? Because CMMC is not exclusive to the parent organization, but it is the organization and every entity that interacts with controlled unclassified information. And so if I have a third party developer who is outsourced to another company and their work interacts with the controlled unclassified information, then I also have to have some mechanism in place to make sure that all of those controls that I'm doing for my organization are also applied to the third party organizations that are doing business with us. And so the requirements are clearly documented, but the effort to put those things in place is very difficult. And when you tie all of this together, CMMC is really just a DOD certification process that serves as the mechanism or the tool that the Department of Defense is going to use to ensure that appropriate security practices and processes are in place. It's going to ensure that basic cyber hygiene exists for all of the contractors in the defense industrial base, and it provides a level of confidence in the trustworthiness of the management of controlled unclassified information outside of the DOD environment when it is on industry partner networks. Now CMMC assessments are gonna take into consideration various types of controls, requirements and standards. Your starting point is going to be NIST, especially in the 800-171, but it's not going to be the ending point. You know, if my organization is using cloud services, NIST has a collection of special publications related to virtualization and cloud security. If part of my controls are related to encryption, NIST has five or six special publications related to the proper installation, configuration, management, and use of cryptographic techniques for confidentiality and integrity. If my organization is dealing with security keys, key management has a distinct special publication for that. And so all of the components of your security program are going to start with descriptions in the control catalog, but you are going to spread out broadly across multiple documents and multiple practices, even when you get into things like media sanitization or system security engineering or access and identity management. All of those things are going to have a supplemental document that describes in exhaustive detail what are the requirements for your organization. Now, our conversation now, and as we transition from Keon's speech into the sharing and caring part of the event, 
one of the things that you do want to consider is that NIST 800-71 is your control catalog that talks about all the controls, but the process and the expectations and the outcomes and the cyber maturity certification levels are going to be found in the draft CMMC model, which is available at acq.osd.mil. If you go to that website, there should be a link for CMMC. And then on that site, there are other materials that you can download to talk about the framework. It talks about the CMMC domains. It talks about the practices and the maturity levels and how all of those things will be combined together to produce a security program that allows your organization to continue to do business with the Defense Department, which is a focus right now, but is probably going to be the standard that's applied to all work that's done for the United States government, whether it is defense or whether it's federal. Now, when you're dealing with the third parties, one of the reasons that CMMC is not a requirement now, but is going to be something that's enforced in the future, is that the CMMC Advisory Board is currently in the process of certifying the third party assessment organizations. And once those organizations are certified, or in conjunction with the certification of the assessment organizations, they also have to certify training providers who are going to teach people what do we need to do to meet all of our obligations that are defined by the certification model. And again, the certification model maps to a federal regulation that governs everything that happens. By this mapping to a federal regulation, it's important to understand that this is a requirement, not an option. And if you don't satisfy the requirements, you are no longer going to be able to do business with the DOD. In a previous session that we had, one of the questions was, well, if we already have a contract, they can't void the contract. That goes back to what I said before about you have a base year plus option years. And at the end of the option year, if you have not met the requirements, the DOD can choose not to exercise the option and they will just find another vendor to work with. It happens all the time in the federal space. It happens all the time in the DOD space. Having a contract today does not mean that you were shielded from the requirements to satisfy CMMC tomorrow. Now, once you complete your assessment, in summary, and then we'll open it up for conversation, upon completion of a CMMC assessment, your company is awarded a certificate at the appropriate CMMC level. The certification is documented in the DOD database, and it enables the verification for other organizations to look at has this company actually been awarded this certification and at what level? Just remember that your certification is not indefinite. You're gonna to have to recertify. You're gonna to have to transform your organization and its practices to maintain the requirements. And just establishing the requirements for a lot of organizations is going to change the way that you do business. It's gonna change the way that you manage data. It's going to change the way that your company operates, regardless of what type of company it is. Don't assume that this is just going to be limited to companies that do information management or data processing. If you're a manufacturing organization and you receive, store, process, or manage controlled unclassified information, CMMC is going to apply to you. If you're a healthcare organization, if you do payroll for the Department of Defense, or if you do anything related to any information, the interpretation of DOD instruction 5200.48 could mean the CMMC applies to any non-DOD organization that receives any information from the Department of Defense. And so it would be better for your success and for your ongoing operations to take this seriously, to work with your DOD partners and to get them to tell you, based on their expectations, what level should you be prepared to be certified at and then start working towards that now because achieving the requirements is gonna take six to nine to 12 to 18 months just to get everything in place for CMMC level one if that's not how you are already designed, organized, and if that's not the way that you have documented all of your controls from the 800-171 control catalog. Now, I should have done a second slide that said that we were transitioning from, you know, Keon Soapbox presentation to the uh, Q&A session. If you joined us late, again, this is meant to be a different event than what you normally attend. I intentionally limited my discussion where I'm on my soapbox telling you what I think and what you need to know for 30 minutes. For the remainder of the time, this is really open season. If you have a question, um, to keep it orderly, please use the features in Zoom to raise your hand. 
I'm happy to give you the floor. Um, your first opportunity to speak, you know, please say who you are, what organization you work with, ask your question. I'm happy to provide a response. Um, Steve Benloss is with us and Steve manages our professional services package. He is a expert in the process and how it works. And between the two of us and based on some of the other people I see at the event, I'm sure that we have plenty of insight that we can share so that we're all in a better position to satisfy our requirements and keep everything going. Yeah, Keon, let me just jump in for a minute. As you guys see, he literally can talk for 30 minutes on one slide. He is a security Wikipedia in my mind. And he's just a fantastic person when it comes uh -oh, to- Uh-oh, Steve, I don't hear you. Let me um, switch headsets. Anybody else hear me okay? Yes, Dave, we hear you. Okay. Yeah, I heard you fine. I'm to put on the right headset to begin with. I apologize for the delay. No sweat. Like I said, I mean, he's literally a walk in security Wikipedia. Um, what I like to try to do is just kind of bake it, bake it down into simplistic terms, right? The initial uh, DOD contracts required you to safeguard federal contract information. That was the requirement. And then you would do self assessments to validate that you are, in fact, safeguarding federal contract information. Well, that wasn't sufficient. We had multiple cybersecurity espionage attacks where we have lost intellectual capital. They have, in fact, today proven that China and Russia have an F-35 warfighter that is identical to our F-35, one that was produced by North of Grumman. So this is real. This is not something that uh, is going to go away. And in my mind, it is a is it is a lifestyle shift change. It's a paradigm shift because they went from safeguarding controlled contract information to now, in fact, classifying uncontrolled information and protecting it. So now you don't have to just safeguard it. You have to protect it and you will be audited on your protective mechanisms and your maturity level. And the way I would give that to you in an analogy is that I got a house, I got a fence, and I got a dog, right? And before, when I was required to safeguard information, I had a Doberman pincher behind the fence, and that Doberman pincher was protecting and safeguarding my area. But now that it's transitioned to controlling and protecting control of classified information, I now have to have an armed guard at my front door because now he is protecting the information behind those walls. And that's the paradigm shift that has happened in the DOD. And as Keon has said, it's gonna happen throughout the local government and municipalities at some point in time. So it's not gonna go back. You will not be able to self attest and say that you in fact are meeting these requirements. You will be audited on those requirements and making sure that you're protected. As Keon mentioned, there's five different levels that go from good housekeeping, good housing, to actually transitioning to level three, which is what level two is. And now you're documenting your processes and you're reacting to your processes and you're following your processes. Level three says everything you do is process oriented and it is all documented and you're following all of that information. Now, as Keon has mentioned, right? When the DOD contracts come out, it'll be identified in the RFIs and RFQs exactly what level that contract expects you to be, whether it's one, two, or three. So you'll know when you're bidding on the contract exactly what level you need to be at. And as he mentioned, it's going to take some time to get there. So it won't be that you can turn around and react to it once the contract comes out. It'll be that you are already at that level certified that level, been audited at that level, and now you can respond back to the RFIs and the RFQs saying that you can deliver that particular um, function for the DOD. So again, it's a lifestyle change, right? It's going not be the same going forward and you need to get on the boat and start rowing or you could be on the shore looking at everybody going in the direction towards CMC and you being left behind. So I don't want to jump on my soapbox because I could probably talk half the time with Keon. And I do want to get some questions in there. 
But again, in a simplistic term, the paradigm is shift. It is no longer safeguarding. It is protecting and controlling information so we don't have our intellectual capital and our war fighters and our troops that are on foreign soils in positions that they can be of harm because we didn't protect, control, and classified information. Tian, I can't hear you talking. I see your lips moving, but. Do we have a volunteer for a question? Don't be shy. This is a small group discussion. I'll ask a question. Um, with um, COVID basically locking a lot of um, the country down and, and forcing people to work from home, um, what kind of adaptations that they're going to have for remote workers um, being able to, to access their information securely from a secure network and, and basically kind of, like Steve said, putting that armed guard um, over your shoulder when you're working remotely. Hey, Lamont, before I answer the question, do you want to say who you are and um, maybe what industry you're in and your interest in CMMC, just so we have a oh. little context? Oh, okay. Um, my name's Lamont McGee. Uh, I own a small uh, IT consulting company, and um, I, I came from IT infrastructure, uh, did a stint in, in IT sales, and I work with um, state and local government, and I left my position in sales to um, pursue, you know, other avenues working with state and local governments and um, in sales. So this is something that's of interest to me because it'll be required of, of my company going forward if I'm gonna work with um, some of the research facilities at the universities and, and other um, local government courthouses and stuff like that. Okay, that makes sense. And the context helps a lot. And so one of the things that all organizations should consider is that the extension in the process that you might have considered was going to be available because of COVID is soon going to expire. You know, we have some stuff that's coming out on 1 October, you know, as they accelerate the process for verifying the third party, the certified third party assessment organizations, once those C3PAOs exist, there's not going to be a lot of leeway. Now, one thing that you do want to consider, there are 350,000 vendors in the defense industrial base. You know, um, Steve and I have been working with the Georgia Department of Economic Development. And so if you're in Georgia, then, you know, there are 9,000 defense contractors in the state of Georgia. And the Department of Economic Development estimates that 20 or 30 percent of those companies are going to stop doing business with the Department of Defense not because they're uninterested in meeting the requirements, but because they have no idea how to meet the requirements. And so this conversation in part is really meant to set everybody up for success. You know, it costs you nothing to go to csrc.nist.gov and to download the 800-171 and start applying the practices yourself. But to answer Lamont's question directly, one of the things that you do wanna consider is that they're gonna do the certifications in tiers. Your tier five and your or your level five and your level four CMMC contracting companies are going to be the highest priority because they have access to the most sensitive and the most critical controlled unclassified information. What I estimate is that it's going to be those organizations that are working on weapon systems or directly impact war fighters on the battlefield. Now, as that is happening and as you start going through the top tier vendors, your Northrop Grumman's, your Lockheed Martin's, and all of those people that are doing planes, trains, automobiles, and firearms for the DOD, then you're gonna start simultaneously getting into the level three, level two, and level one CMMC organizations because the people that are doing the third party attestations will have completed their work with the big guys and then they'll have more time for the little guys. Number one, number two, the scope of a smaller organization is less, it's gonna take less time for the CMMC certification. And so you'll start to see it ramp up very rapidly once they get going. Uh, if I were to give you an estimate, I don't really do uh, forecasts or try to estimate what's gonna happen in the future, but I would say it's reasonable to expect by this time next year, 
they're going to be rocking and rolling because they're going to have an entire year to focus on the bigger companies and then start having to trickle down to smaller companies. And hopefully the CMMCAB will get their act together so that they can standardize the requirements, the expectations, the processes, and have the certifications for the third party, certified third party assessment organizations. I keep forgetting to put certified on the front. For FedRAMP, it was just third party assessment organization. For CMMC, a certified third party assessment organization because the same, the same process that I have to be certified at a certain level, the assessment organizations also have to be certified and all of those certified third party assessment organizations are also going to be listed on the CMMC website. So you know who can I work with to complete my attestation and the certification at whatever level is required. And so Lamont, before I move on to the next question, did I answer your question? Yeah, you did. Okay, excellent. So we have a question from the billion dollar CISO himself, Mr. Wes Knight. I, I really did have a question, Keon. I just want to say you were dead on the money um, with, with this. Uh, the, the people that I've talked to, they don't understand um, what level they need to be at. They don't understand when they need to do it. They don't understand how to get started. Um, yeah, and I'm expecting like you were talking about earlier, there's going to be a fair amount of dropout in the defense industry for people who either don't want to pay the money to get it done or find themselves staring at a wall and trying to figure out what to do. Um, so I, I, you, I don't know if you were on the tag call earlier today as well, but they said a lot of the, a lot of the same kind of things, but it was, uh, it was very interesting. You, I think you are dead on the money with what you just said. And for those of you who are not in Georgia, because I see some friends from other places, TAG is the Technology Association of Georgia, and they do a lot of work with the state. Uh, they forgot to invite me to be their keynote speaker for their CMMC <laughs> conversation. But it's a conversation that people who have been doing this for a while do recognize because we had the same things happen. You know, it happened with GDPR, it happened with FedRAMP, it happened with FISMA. People who don't have the knowledge or the capability to meet the requirement pick up their ball and go to a different playground. The, you know, the challenge in the CMMC sense is that if you have a bunch of critical subcontractors and contractors that are providing valuable services for the Department of Defense and we lose those people, that could be detrimental to the mission of the Department of Defense. You know, somebody makes a golden widget and they say, I don't want to be bothered with this. Now we no longer have somebody making a golden widget. And so we want to prepare people in advance as much as possible so that they don't get shocked out of the defense industrial base so that they don't go away because of fear of their requirements. Anytime you're building a security program, doing it organically over time rather than rushing to throw something together is always going to produce a better result. And our advocacy in this conversation is go ahead and start now so that you have time to build up what needs to be in place to allow you to continue working with the Department of Defense and with the federal government. And the byproduct of all of your efforts is that you're gonna have a good security program to protect everything that your organization does for the world. I'm gonna pop in for just a second and ask Wes to go ahead and identify himself so people can understand the experience that he's speaking from in his previous uh, life. So Wes, could you just identify a little bit of the background? Yeah, I, I was the former CISO with the Department of Revenue here in Georgia. <clears throat> and since my um, retirement in quotes uh, in February, I have been um, running my own company and doing uh, some contract type work for another company. And a lot of what I spend my time on are CMNC assessments and audits and things like that. So I talk to a lot of people, um, as Stephen does about this particular subject, um, and uh, it's uh, it's pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. Thanks, Wes. Yeah, I just wanted to also identify when we're talking about CNC and the different levels. What's important to understand is, from a DoD standpoint, right? Seventy to eighty percent of their contracts will fall into the one, two, and three level. So. It is the four and five that Keon mentions that are going to be the big Lockheed Mark and the general dynamics. But 70 to 80% of the contracts will have to be required 
to meet CMC level three. That's a pretty big number of that 9,000 and something, something that Keon mentioned earlier. So it is something that is gonna affect a large percentage of the population in those first three levels. So I just wanted you to give a scope of understanding of how it's gonna affect the different people in the DOD contract base right now. Okay, so we still have a few minutes left in the conversation. Do we have another volunteer to share some insight, to ask a question or to contribute something valuable to the conversation? I'll go ahead if you don't mind. Yeah, um, sure. Please, please is, don't forget to introduce yourself, your organization, and share what you do to make the world a better place. All right. Well, thank you. My name is Lee McCorder. I'm the CTO of Covered Six out in California. We're kind of a unique veteran-owned security firm. We offer training and services and products across the holistic range of security from physical to cyber. Um, I want to thank you guys for for throwing this together. It's something that's come up a few times through some of our clients and we wanted to get a little more on it. I'm actually got one specific, maybe a little too technical, but I don't find it on the site and you guys seem to be in the know. So actually I'm curious about if there's any information on how to become a C3PAO. I don't see that on the site. They say they're defining that process, but that's something we're interested in as well as just getting more versed on this to get ready for ourselves and our clients. Hey, I, I think that's a great question. Um, thank you very much, Lee, for dropping that in the conversation. Um, the CMMC Advisory Board, CMMCAB, has not been the best at communicating a consistent message. And so one day I'm gonna convince them to do my cyber executive master class where I'm a teacher and Wes is a teacher. And one of the items that you have in there is a uh, message man mapping guide that says you have to be clear and concise and specific. And a lot of that is missing. And so instead of you know telling you what I think you should do in the absence of formal documentation, a good framework for becoming a certified third-party assessment organization is to be to look at the requirements for FedRAMP. You know, one of the things that has come out in the CMMC conversation is that if your organization is FedRAMP certified and you have no plan of action and milestone that documents a deficiency that you have to meet, the CMMC advisory board is considering approving a grandfathering process where they take all of the things that you've already done for FedRAMP they accept them from CM, for CMMC and then allow you to be certified at least for the initial year before you have to do a recertification to ensure that everything is still in place. Because that exists and because CMMC AB has already talked about adopting some of the practices or at least approving through a grandfathering process, some of the organizations that have already been certified under FedRAMP there is already a clearly defined process for becoming a third-party assessment organization for FedRAMP so that you can evaluate cloud service providers. Um, once upon a time in a previous organization, I helped a company that I worked for become certified as a third-party assessment organization for FedRAMP. And based on that process, I can tell you that there is an ISO standard similar to ISO 9000, but it's a different number that I can't think of right now, that causes you to formally document all your processes and your approach. There's also requirements that you certify your environment. For example, if I'm receiving information from people so that I can evaluate their controls, then that needs to be a highly protected environment so that other people are not compromised because I can't manage data about somebody else's security controls. Very often, another organization's security controls would be considered controlled unclassified information or critical information. And so for your organization, if you're going to be an assessment organization, you do want to make sure that you have good practices in place. You have a designated in part of your organization that is physically and logically separated, so you don't have a lot of crosstalk and bleed between types of data. If you're an international organization, for my previous employer, they had to set up a subsidiary, which is how you end up with companies like CGI and Lockheed Martin that have a federal branch. They have that federal branch because it's a company within the company and the federal part that's established is completely separate in its operations, management, and data processing from the rest of the company that might do other things. 
And so if you go to FedRAMP and look at the requirements for becoming a third party assessment organization, it will at least get you started so that you don't have to wait until the last minute. The other thing that I can say, and this is with a, um, I'm a little salty about this, but one of my frustrations about CMMC compared to FedRAMP is that FedRAMP focused on quality and precision and making sure that we were doing something that mattered for the federal government. There are some things that the CMMC advisory board has done that make people think that this is just a money grab. You know, the cost for some of the certifications, you know, to be a third, to be a certified um, practitioner is like $500 at a minimum just for an individual certified practitioner. And that's really just a background check and some identity proofing. And then you get into products that are $750 and then things that are $500. And then to get your organization certified as an advisory company could be up to $5,000, or you could spend $500,000 to be um, one of the third party assessment organizations once they finalize the requirements. And so instead of investing in advance and then being like class LLC, where we're still waiting on approval to use that designation that we paid for months ago, it, it would be more valuable to start building the practices and putting them in place based on what FedRAMP has documented rather than paying and investing in the confusion. So that once CMMCAB finally gets their act together, you've already got the framework in, pay, in place based on another program that is already existing, that's already mature, and has already been working. You know, the dual benefit is that if you follow the FedRAMP third-party assessment organization and get that certification, now you have two products that you can offer to the world instead of only focusing on CMMC. Because the other thing with CMMC that we are observing is that a lot of companies are gonna wait to the last minute. You know, we saw that with GDPR. GDPR was coming for two years and it took organizations to invest after they saw that somebody finally got fined. And so we're probably gonna have either high levels of attrition, like Wes talked about that they mentioned at the Technology Association of Georgia meeting, or we're gonna see high levels of attrition because people just don't wanna be bothered. And when they don't get their contract renewed, they're gonna go away. And so my professional recommendation to a fellow service provider is that as broadly as possible, you want to position yourself and FedRAMP isn't going anywhere. And the assessment of cloud service providers is still on an upward trajectory. So that could be a good investment to focus on FedRAMP first and then do whatever you need to add to the process to satisfy your requirements for CMMC as a certified third party assessment organization. Thank you, that's a great answer. I very much appreciate it. Yep, my pleasure. I think we have time for at least one more question and then we'll close it out for today. Do I have a volunteer? I'll volunteer um, for small, smaller companies. And like you said, if, if I'm a really specialized company and I make a widget, um, how are they going to um, set things up? Because the government moves glacially slow. And like you said, it took them two years for um, GDPR. But in the case of the smaller companies that they look at it and they're like, we're, there's no way we're spending that money to meet that requirement. Are there going to be avenues for those smaller companies to work through a third party for, you know, distribution? And, um, oh man, I can't remember uh, the name of it. One of the uh, gentlemen for Georgia, um, the company that handles all the universities and does a lot of their... Um, IT security and, and purchasing. Oh, I, basically. The, the people based ahead. in Augusta. I can't think of their name, but I know who you're talking about. Yep, but the, just, I think it's called TAG or something similar to that. But you're, you're probably talking about the Georgia Technology Authority. Yes, yes. But I think of uh, G, Grand Theft Auto and I think GTA. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> But just um, that's not far from the truth. The <laughs> <laughs> and and that that's kind of what I'm getting at is you know the the cost of entry like you alluded to is going to be pretty high and for smaller companies it's not really going to be that easy. But regardless of what it is, they're still going to need to buy what it is that you're selling just because you're not certified. So you know how do you think they're going to handle that? Well, I think for the DoD. So I was in the army. 
And so I'm familiar with um, DOD practices as a prior service member. And then I was a contracting officer's representative at the Centers for Disease Control, which is kind of the civilian equivalent of what the oversight people do for DFARS. One of the things that we're gonna run into is that where the golden widget is optimal, if it is not available, it's just gonna drive the price up for services because you're gonna have smaller numbers of people competing in the marketplace. And so there is a risk on one hand where fewer competitors drives prices up just based on the economics of supply and demand, but there is always going to be somebody who wants to make a widget. And there is always gonna be somebody who wants to make a component and one of the things that I've discovered talking to some of my friends at NIST and talking to some of my friends in the DOD is that the increased cost of goods and services is acceptable when you consider the risk of bad security practices and not enforcing a standardized requirement. You know, the positive outcome of FISMA. I think when I was at CDC, it took us four or five years before we got people to conform across the entire agency to all of the requirements for the Federal Information Security Management Act. And at the same time, you saw the consequences of people not doing things properly, where the VA loses a laptop that has 75 million records for um, prior service members, or the Department of um, Personnel, the Office of Personnel Management loses all those records, or you have Aetna, who is doing healthcare for all of the federal employees. There are so many examples of the harm that is caused to individuals by not doing security well, that the Department of Defense is really putting their foot on the brake and saying, you either satisfy the requirements or you don't. And if you don't, because you can't, that is not our problem. And building in advance, I think is gonna help a lot of people. But you know, when you look at NIST 800-171, at least half of those requirements are policy and procedure. A lot of those requirements, you already have the processes in place if you have good security hygiene or if you're working with good security vendors. Like I see one of my friends on here from a fabulous security company and his company provides a very valuable security solution. And what I'm finding as we talk to vendors, because our company doesn't do technology management, we only do people process and strategy but some of our counterparts who are in technology organizations, they actually help their customers document, how does my product satisfy CMMC requirements so that when you as a consumer of my product are documenting your system security plan, we as the product or solution provider have made it easy for you. You know, it's one of the things that I begged service providers to do when I was at the CDC, because I have to document the system security plan, whether I want to or not, and the more I know about how a vendor is satisfying specific requirements, they might not do all the control families, but if I'm buying an encryption product, they should be able to tell me in this language, which controls do I satisfy and how are those controls satisfied in writing so I can just take what the vendor provides and then put it in my system security plan. And so part of that is gonna lead you to identifying who are the vendors that I wanna work with. You know, if I'm working with a, um, MSSP, then maybe my decision criteria is how well are you documenting things that I need to document so that I can keep working with the Department of Defense? Or if I'm buying a product from a company, you know, how does your product satisfy these NIST 800 171 requirements so I can just take your language and incorporate it into my system security plan? One of the positive outcomes of CMMC is going to be that the people who are serious about doing this properly are going to create a new and unique ecosystem where everybody is working together, everybody is holding each other accountable, and everybody is formally documenting how all of this stuff works. So we have a better understanding about the interconnections between systems and services so that we can manage data well in the modern world. And then worst case scenario, you can always just call me or Steve and we'll help you build it from scratch because that's what we do. Now, this webinar was not a sales pitch, but it is a factual statement. We have spent a lot of time doing this and whether it's just, you know, shooting the breeze because it's a Saturday and I'm sipping on coffee or it is a professional services engagement and we help you solve the problem. We are one of many companies that are out there that are helping um, organizations stay in business, which is why we called the you know, the subtitle of this conversation was the steps to keep working with the DOD. We really could have called this, how do you stay in business and not fail because you can't meet a security requirement. 
And Lee, I just wanted to say thanks for joining the call based on my request, because I know you have a, a lot of knowledge in the security field. There is some additional information out there. Um, as Keon has said, and I think if Lamont mentioned how the government moves, glacially slow. I like that term, Lamont. But in fact, uh, if you go out to the CMCAB, they do have some documentation that talks about the requirements and roadmap to get to a certified third-party assessor organization, better known as C3PO. And that information, take it with a grain of salt, but it does give you some guidelines on what it's going to take to get there. It is price prohibited, as Kim <laughs> mentioned. It just continues to tick up, up, and up. But they do have criteria out there that they're trying to formalize of what the requirements will be to get to that third party um, assessor organization. My understanding is they have people right now going through that process. I don't know exactly where those people are. The AB is the ones that have that information, but there's nobody that has completed uh, that third party assessor organization uh, as I know it today. And Kian, you could speak a little bit better than that to me, but I don't think anybody's certified at this point. No, they're still working on it. They'll get certified eventually. So Lee, I'll be happy to provide that to you after, or if we can answer it in, in, uh, in this session, I'll add it to our comments here so that anybody else that has that question can look down that path. I appreciate you guys having me, it was fun. Sure. A lot. Thanks. Awesome, awesome. So in closing, because we value everybody's time, um, we scheduled this for 90 minutes, just so that you have a little bit of a buffer, but we are going to go ahead and say farewell for today.